Hello everyone and welcome back to Gage Hill Crafts. I'm Sarah and um, I thought that I was going to post a video about making maple syrup today. However, I realized that that would be a bit disjointed with the um, other things that are going on today in the world of Gage Hill Crafts, namely the launch of my new pattern called Inner Harbor. Um, that has come out today. It's on Ravelry and you can go ahead and get it either from Ravelry or from our website, gaychillcrafts.com. Um, so I thought what would be a better match content-wise was to talk a little bit about my design inspiration and the process of translating ideas into designs. So I'm going to walk you through some of my designs that I've published so far and um, as well as show you how some previous ideas are leading into new concepts that will be coming up in new designs. Um, I have seen or read interviews with designers uh, talking about their work and I think just like with authors or artists or other creative um, people, it's very difficult to express in words uh, what is happening in your brain when you're creating some new idea. Um, and I'm not sure I'm going to be any better at it than, than other people uh, I've read who are trying to tackle the subject. But I've been thinking about it more closely and I'm hoping that maybe some of this might be helpful. Um, especially if you're thinking about starting to do your own uh, knit or crochet designs. Um, I'm not an expert. I am completely self-taught. I have absolutely no formal, you know, textile training or art school training uh, or anything like that. So I will say that there are much better authorities out there and much more um, cohesive methods of education. But that said, you know, I found some, some tips and tricks that work for me to either help me get out of a rut if I'm trying to come up with a new idea and I'm not really getting there. Um, and also just some, some patterns, um, no pun intended, <laughs> some patterns that I've noticed in my own way of thinking or trying to solve design problems. Um, and again, I just thought that might be either entertaining or maybe even educational. So let's start talking about my first design um, that I really came up with from scratch on my own, and that's the poncho that I'm wearing. So this is the Prospect Street Poncho. <laughs> it is a little tricky to say. Um, it's designed in Harrisville Designs, uh, their Highland yarn, which is their uh, worsted weight, and all of their yarns are wool and spun. So the yarn has a beautiful um, multicolored kind of aspect to it. This reads sort of green or teal, um, in person, it's more teal than it probably appears on the screen. But if you look up close, there's, you know, flecks of other colors. And I'm pointing this out because in this case, the inspiration for this piece was the yarn itself. Um, my mother attends uh, fiber arts workshops and she went um, to Harrisville. They, they have a number of uh, retreats and workshops throughout the year and took one of their multi-day programs. And um, as a thank you for me to for watching her pets while she was gone, she brought back six skeins of this yarn. Um, now at first I thought I might make a sweater. When I did the math at the time, I wasn't really sure if uh, I could get a whole sweater out of it. Um, I think probably in hindsight I could have. But um, so I thought of sort of another layering piece, which was a poncho. Now I went online and looked in uh, the knitting books that I have and couldn't really find anything that I liked. Um, either des the designs were too complicated and I thought they would take away from the look of the yarn or they had features on them that I didn't like, like fringe um, or cables. So I th started messing around and I thought well, maybe I can come up with my own idea for this. Um, now I was inspired by some other cable, con um, sorry, some po other poncho constructions that I had seen, which is two pieces of fabric sewn together. 
So you knit two rectangles, you sew them together in a certain way. Um, it creates a neck opening automatically based on the proportion of the pieces of fabric and how they fit together. And so um, that was a good starting point. Now for the texture, that was kind of where I had to do some creativity on my own and come up with something that would work. Um, I needed a fabric that would lay flat. So that eliminated many different texture patterns, including stockinette. I didn't want just plain stockinette in the first place, but um, even if I had wanted just a plain fabric, stockinette was not gonna work. Um, I could have done something like all over one by one rib, which is what the, the diagonals are, but that pulls the fabric in a lot. And so you have to end up knitting and using up more yarn to get the width. And that was probably gonna use up more yarn than I have to get the size that I wanted. So I couldn't just do the rib. So I came up with the idea of some kind of wide stripes that would draw your eye around the body and across the front diagonally um, to kind of disguise any you know, body shape elements that you may not want to draw attention to um, and create a flattering silhouette. And so after experimenting a bit, I came up with this textured pattern here, um, which does lay flat. It's essentially a modified seed stitch or moss stitch. Um, and then alternating that with the, the ribbing just to give it some vis visual interest. Uh, but again, not make it too busy. These are very wide stripes. So um, it still shows off the yarn well and the fabric lays flat. Now the other design challenge I had was how the borders of the different pieces of fabrics were going to look once they everything was sewn together and whether I could get a cohesive outline around the whole piece so that the entire piece looked bordered and looked intentional. Um, not like you had sewn a couple of scraps of fabric together in an odd way. And what I did was I figured out how to match up the width of one section of this texture um, vertically with the length of, that's down here, the length of the texture that you knit before you begin the two textured section. So that when you get to this seam here, it looks cohesive. It comes all along, and that goes around the, the long triangles of, um, of the poncho. So forgive me if I'm looking at a weird place. I have the video up on my screen, which I normally don't, but because I'm trying to point things out, I have to do that. So if I'm looking in the wrong place, please excuse me. Anyway, so having all those lines come together in a cohesive way meant balancing the, the width of the knitted pieces uh, on some areas with the vertical knitted section of other pieces of the fabric. Um, and what I did was I just sketched it out on paper and I even um, cut up little pieces of paper and taped them together to make a 3D model so that I could visualize this. Um, again, no formal training, you know, I don't know how other people are taught to do this, but when you're self-taught, you just kind of muddle through, I guess, and, until you come up with something that works. Um, so that worked out really well. I, I'm sure I knit a swatch for this. I'm pretty sure I did to get some idea of how big I wanted the fabric pieces to be. But I do remember knitting along on the first piece of fabric and then just kind of draping it diagonally across my shoulder and turning and, you know, fiddling with it until I thought that it would be big enough and then saying, okay, I'll knit another one. And then really hoping when I knit that second piece of fabric, um, I kind of basted the edges together and crossed my fingers and put it on. And fortunately it fit exactly the way that I wanted it to. And it was the length that I wanted. Um, now this piece does come in just the one size. 
uh, for written out directions. But in the pattern, I do tell you how to modify the size so that if you are um, larger or smaller, then you can get something that fits you approximately the same way. Um, you know, there, there's been a lot of talk about sizing in knitting patterns, especially self-published patterns, uh, where people may not be following kind of standard sizing. Um, and, and I agree that that can create a huge problem and be a real letdown for the knitter who wants to make something, sees it on a model that is not the size and shape that they are, and kind of hopes for the best and buys something and then ends up really disappointed. Um, so I certainly don't want that to happen. I don't believe in one size fits all, but I do believe in kind of one size fits many for something like this. That's just, you know, basically a big double triangle um, that kind of drapes over your body. Now you may, this triangle point almost comes down to my knees. That might be too long for you. And so if you don't want that kind of a fit, or if you're shorter than I am, I'm about 5'5", five five, um, the pattern does tell you how to make this overall smaller, both width-wise and length-wise, so that, you know, this thing isn't um, awkwardly long on you, or awkwardly short. Um, if you're taller, I have a friend, I have a couple of female friends that are over six feet tall, um, and so they might want to knit this a little bit larger um, for their size. So I do think including including modifications or at least hints um, is good in patterns and in this case it's all about proportion. The width of each piece of fabric to the length of each piece of fabric influences the overall shape and the fit. So that's pretty easy to do some simple math there to guide the knitter into um, a size that will work for them. So that was this pattern. Again, you know, problem solving. I didn't see a pattern like this online. I kind of had in my head what I wanted. I didn't see anything that I liked. Um, and so coming up with something that had the right texture and the right fabric qualities for the yarn um, resulted in the finished piece. Um, next, we have the Bethel hat. And that's this textured hat. Again, you've seen me uh, wear this a lot. It's a slouchy hat. And there are probably, you know, a couple thousand hats similar to this on Ravelry. Um, in this case, rather than being inspired directly by the yarn, I was really inspired by going through a stitch dictionary and looking up different textures and um, decided this would be really, really cute for a hat. Um, now, on this one, as you can see, the crown decreases evenly, but there's no, and I don't know if you can really tell that, there's no break in the pattern, there's no visual break. So you don't, unlike some crown decreases where they have some kind of a decorative, um, like a star shape or wave shape that comes in as you decrease for the crown. On this one, I wanted it to be invisible. So that was really the design challenge here was to create a hat um, that would fit well. I actually designed it in three different sizes. So this is the small, I don't have my large sample anymore. This would be like a, a youth size. I like to wear the medium. Um, and this actually fits Rick pretty well too. And then the larger would be for a larger head or if you have very fluffy hair and don't want a tight fitting hat. Um, so, you know, redoing the math and making sure that the decreases worked for all three sizes in the same way. Now I will admit I got that a little bit wrong the first time I published the pattern. Um, in the large size, I had done something slightly different to change the stitch count in the first set of decreases so that um, then for each hat I could just do the final set of decreases in the same way but that actually broke up the pattern and left you with like a weird remainder when you're you know knitting however many and then knit two together and knit and repeat that um, so I had to go back on the large size and fix that it is now fixed if you download the Bethel hat you will have um, 
the same un uninterrupted uh, invisible crown shaping on all three sizes. Um, but do look out for that. You know, when you're when you're grading your patterns out, when you're coming up with different sizes, sometimes unexpected things can happen, or it can be tricky to kind of hit certain sizes because the math isn't working out, and you have to get a little creative in your problem solving um, for that those kinds of shaping issues. Like, you know, maybe something works in a in a small size and it works in the large size because the large is some you know even multiple of that but then in the medium size it doesn't quite work the same way that can happen so um, again without formal training I can't give you an exact guide on like how to fix those problems um, usually you just have to sit down with I just sit down with a pencil and paper um, and do math and kind of figure out okay my starting stitch counts here my ending stitch counts there I need to get from here to there in this many rows. What are some options? And then how does that gonna play out in different sizes? Um, I know a lot of people have spreadsheets and there's like design software you can buy and all of that. Um, I haven't looked into that because I, I haven't really had a need for it yet. Um, and there's gonna be a learn, there's gonna be a pretty steep learning curve when I do. So I've just been sort of putting that off and working pencil and paper and sketching things out. Um, but I will link in the show notes to some books and some other resources that uh, might help you um, with kind of the math side of things um, and also with the pattern description side of things, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Um, so continuing on with this inspiration, I really liked this textured all over pattern. And I like to wear, um, when I make accessories, I like to wear matching accessories so that I don't look like a crazy knitwear person. Um, <laughs> I think I think all of us, you know, we go to these festivals and events and it's like people have on almost everything they've ever knit, which is cool and we're among our people and that's fine. But I don't I don't know that most people dress that way most of the time, if you know what I mean. Um, most people like to kind of match or like look a little more put together. So I wanted to create some mitts. Sorry, I'm picking dog hair off these. Um, some fingerless mitts that would match this hat. Now, these don't match in color, obviously, but it's the same type of yarn. This is the Green Mountain Spinnery Music yarn. And um, it is the same texture pattern. So that was not too difficult. I just had to translate um, from the hat onto a, a fingerless mitt. Um, kind of body, figure out how I wanted to do the thumb, um, which is in a ribbing that matches the uh, cast on and the hand uh, ribbing on this one. And again, I decided to make it in two sizes. Um, the small sort of fits a youth to um, a small medium size, I guess for an adult. And then the larger size fits I'll say it fits an adult male hand, a large male hand, or um, but not not like the largest size. You would have to go up another size. So this only comes in two sizes. Um, maybe I'll do a third size at some point. If you need a third size and you bought this pattern, let me know. I'd love to know. Um, um, from there, I kept going. I thought, oh, what will it look like on socks? And so there you go. Now this pattern is not out yet. This is going to be the Bethel socks and these will be released this summer as part of the Bethel collection because I have another um, design in the works for one more accessory. So it'll be a set of four accessories in a nice little booklet. Um, I don't usually do textures on the bottoms of my socks. So you can see these are just plain stockinette, but um, the tops of the socks and then all the way around the leg um, we have that stitch, stitch pattern. So yeah, so take one, you know, take one stitch pattern and run with it and see what you can do with it, what it'll look good on. Um, so that's one kind of, another way to, to be inspired and to come up with different ideas. Um, now lately I have been looking at sequence knitting 
which is another way of making all over textures. Um, but it's, it's a little bit different. Uh, serpentine sequence knitting means that you're knitting, you're starting a particular sequence, say, say it's knit to purl to, right? Which would normally be just a two by two ribbing, but you might continue that on an odd number of stitches. So knit two, purl two, knit two, purl two, knit two, purl two, knit one, and then you're at the end of the row. So then you go to the next row and you knit one and purl two to finish that part of the sequence and then knit two, purl two, knit two, purl two. And then you get to the end and you might be on a knit two, purl one. And then you purl one on the next row. So you keep going back and forth. And what that creates is a pattern of a fabric that does repeat, but it doesn't repeat in strict columns. Um, it repeats in a different way, depending on how the sequence is broken up across rows. It makes really interesting textures, and in some cases it makes a reversible fabric. And it was the reversible aspect that inspired me to um, come up with the pattern for the Inner Harbor shawl. Um, now I modeled this shawl last time, so you can go back in the previous video and see me wearing this. But you can see this kind of has a wave-like texture on it. Now the sequence in the um, book that I saw did not have multiple colors. So it just had one, one color and it had a two-sided fabric. So you can see those look the same on both sides. But I wanted to try it in two colors. So I ran into my stash and I got this little... Um, set of mini skeins. I think it was meant to be for socks. Um, and it had five different colors in it. And so I started alternating. I knit with one color for a little while and then I started alternating colors to make a two-sided fabric. Now this is not showing up on screen right now. Um, this is actually shifting color. In person it goes from some an orangey red like a vermilion down into like a hot several different tones of hot magenta. Um, but it's really hard to see that. So let me pull it up to here where you have, excuse my stitch holder here, where you have the two colors sort of stripey effect going on. So here I'm alternating, I'm keeping the sequence intact, but I'm alternating the colors every two rows. So two rows of the lighter, I guess red color and two rows of the purple. Um, and you can see that still makes a reversible fabric. And when I say reversible, I really do mean reversible. Um, if you've knit garter stitch uh, shawls in a single color, they look reversible. If you knit garter stitch in stripes, um, I'll try to put a picture in here. You get nice stripes on one side, and you get sort of little teeth on the other, where the pearl bumps are kind of lining up with each other. And I have never been a fan of that look. Um, so for a shawl, something that you can put on and style different ways, and both sides of the fabric could potentially be on display, it was important for me to come up with something else that was truly reversible. So this pattern is. So once I had kind of figured this out, this is basically a big swatch. It's going to be um, a scarf, but I was on deadline, a self-imposed deadline to finish my sample for the Inner Harbor Shawl. And so as soon as I got that yarn in the mail and had figured out the kind of the math for what I wanted to do, I set this down and cast that on. So I need to go back and finish this. I have a little bit more to knit on it. Um, but you can see that the texture and the two color striping translated right into the finished shawl. There was an increased eyelet row here, which I'll talk about in just a second. But basically, you know, the swatch idea just continued on. And so now you have all these shifting colors together in one 
finished project. There are sections of solid, so you go from a two color here into this solid, and then back into the next two color of the gradient. Um, now at first I thought this shawl was going to be a trapezoid, um, but to make a trapezoid you have to increase on one side and decrease on the other and that skews your fabric. And that was starting to make my hair hurt. So, <laughs> so I was trying to figure out some kind of an interesting shape um, that was not a wide triangle. And I decided to come up with a long triangle instead. So this shawl ended up being a kind of a sail shape. There's the edge is much wider. And then you, when you're cast on, you increase quickly to this kind of narrow. So it's, you know, it's, it's like a, a very skinny isosceles triangle. Um, and that's very wearable. I think, you know, you can style it in a bunch of different ways. Um, but as I was drawing this out, you know, here's one page from my notebook, right? And I'm still, I'm trying to figure out, okay, colors A, B, C, D, and E, and how are they going to blend together, and where am I going to increase? But, you know, you can see in this earlier draft, I was still operating on two points with a wider section in the middle. Um, after doing a bunch of math, I decided that wasn't going to be, that was going to be, sort of too long and skinny on two points. So, um, you know, there's a fair amount of, in, in this case I swatched, I figured out my stitch and my row gauge, and then I used those numbers to, on paper, say, okay, well if it was this long, how wide would it be? Or if it was that wide here, and then averaged out to this width over the whole shawl, how long would it be? Um, and just kept playing with that and playing with that and trying it out on different shapes to see what would happen, and then settled on the, the final shape. Because I was also concerned about using up all of the yarn in the gradient set, um, not wasting anything, and not running out of yarn before I wanted to. So um, one of the ways that you can, can check your yarn usage, which is important, um, is to knit a fairly large swatch um, figure out how many stitches total are in that swatch, weigh the swatch, and then do the division. And um, this is where a scale that measures in tenths of a gram is really handy um, because you're going to get 0 .00 something 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 grams per stitch. But then what you can do is use that information, your row gauge and your stitch gauge, to play around with your shapes and sort of figure out you know, okay, if I cast on this many stitches and make it this shape, where's it going to end? Or how long can it be before I'm going to run out of yarn? Or how many times can I increase? What's my average width and length for that shape? And where am I going to end up? Um, and I will say that in, in many cases, it is better to have maybe 20% yarn overage, um, 15 to 20% yarn overage for however many skeins of yarn you're including in your design because you don't want your knitter to be playing yarn chicken and panicking at the end of their project and if they're off by a fraction of a stitch in their swatch, let's say they're, they're a very good knitter and they sit down and they do their swatch and they think they've gotten gauge but they're off by like a quarter of a stitch over four inches, they may not notice that or be able to see that, but it will still impact how much yarn they have left over at the end, and so you don't want them running up against a brick wall of, of no yarn. On the flip side of that, um, we've all been there where, say a design calls for two skeins of yarn, and we sit down and we knit our thing, and we use up one skein and like 25 yards or something, of the next skein. And so you have this almost a full ball left over at the end, which just feels like a waste, right? It's kind of frustrating, um, especially if you're using, you know, nice yarn, expensive yarn. You've spent all that money on a, ball, a whole ball or a whole skein of yarn and barely, 
used any of it. So that's why I think it's good to have kind of a happy medium and, you know, try to end up with maybe 10 to 15 percent even uh, yarn left over so that you have some leeway for your knitter, um, but you're not wasting a ton of yarn at the end. Now in this shawl design, I will say that you do use up every scrap of yarn, but um, I have you make the tassels first so that you don't run out of yarn and go, okay, I don't have any yarn to make my tassels. And I also, I, I judge um, how much yarn of each color to use by weight and not by like the size of the knitting as you're going. And what that does is it allows you to use up all the yarn without going over. Because if I say, do this until you have this much yarn left over, then, and then do the next step, um, you're not going to run out of yarn, right? Unless you like blow past the directions or something. Um, it's easy to just get out your scale and say, okay, she said when I have five grams left, do this next step. Um, I hope that makes sense. So there are different ways to kind of explain how much knitting to do. You can do it in, you know, number of rows is pretty common. You can do it in the length of a, a portion of something like knit this until it's this long and then start doing this. Um, that's also very common, but you can do it by weight as well, depending on what you're knitting. You know, do be kind to your knitter and that kind of leads me into another thing about writing knitting patterns in general um, or, or coming up with different designs or construction methods. You, knitting for most people is their hobby. Um, and so you want their hobby to be fun. Therefore, you want the knitting experience to be fun. Um, it could be challenging, right? Some people like a challenge. They like a complicated lace chart or they like, um, you know, taking their time with some kind of shaping or fitting to, to ensure that the garment will really fit well. Or maybe it's some kind of fancy em embellishment or something like that. What you don't want is a knitting technique or a design feature that sort of doesn't have any rhyme or reason to it or, or maybe doesn't have a rhythm to it. Um, I will say that I'm guilty of coming up with a cowl pattern that uh, is it's a color work pattern and there's no symmetry to it. So I think for some people this might not be a very pleasant knit because you can't get into any kind of groove in the rows. You have to count every few stitches and knit that according to this rather complicated chart. Um, so I have, I have done this myself um, for good reason. I wanted um, a natural fern shape and to get the pattern that I wanted it just wasn't going to be rhythmic or symmetrical. But for the most part, most knitting patterns, you want, you know, fairly short repeats, something that you can memorize, um, something that has some kind of fluidity to it, even if it's complicated. Let's say it's like a, a lace repeat with 24 rows or something. That's fine. Um, but, you know, either have really good reason for it to be complicated or make it fun and simple and easy on your knitter. I think at least at least one of those choices. Um, and make sure you spell that out. Ravelry has a great feature. The way that, that, you know, the patterns are, the pattern preview page, if you will, is laid out, is that you can write descriptive stuff in your notes to kind of guide the person as to whether or not they're going to want to get involved in this pattern before they buy it. So you can tell them what techniques are expected. You can tell them kind of what's tricky about the pattern, if there is any tricky tricky business. Um, I don't like to say that my patterns are for beginning knitters or for intermediate knitters or for advanced knitters because, you know, 
sometimes an advanced knitter wants to knit something that's easy. Um, sometimes an easy or beginning level knitter wants to expand their skill set and learn something that's a little bit more challenging. So I don't like to classify the knitter, but I do like to point out if there's some characteristic of the fabric or the pattern um, that's going to be, that they're gonna to have to wrap their head around, um, learn a new skill, or that just might be a little bit of a slog. Maybe it's a bit of a slog and that's okay because your knitter is a product knitter and they're willing to slog through it a little bit in order to get the finished item because they love they love the look of it. Um, I'm certainly that way. I'm willing to kind of take on something that's a bit more fiddly or challenging if I know that I'm going to enjoy the product at the end. But you don't want to hide any of that information or make it mysterious as to what the knitter's getting into, what they can expect um, from the pattern. And you know, allow people to self-select. Um, I would much rather someone look at my kind of preamble and description of the pattern and decide it's not for them than to have them buy something and be really dissatisfied with it. Um, and, you know, I, I think that makes sense and I think we can all agree there um, in our own knitting that we would like to know what we're getting ourselves in for and be really happy and proud of the finished product um, once we get to the end of something. So those are my kind of tips and insights. Um, I will just say, as far as inspiration, if you are trying to come up with ideas for knitted garments and um, you're having trouble doing that, um, you can look to a lot of different places for inspiration. Uh, a lot of patterns these days are inspired by things like nature, and that might be the color combinations that people are seeing. It could be the shapes. Um, people get inspired by architecture. And I'm not just talking about um, the facades of buildings, but things like tile work or parquet floors, um, wallpaper. Um, things like that can, can give you ideas for different shapes, textures, color combinations. Um, that you can explore. And I'm a terrible drawer. Um, I would never try to manually illustrate anything myself or um, put any kind of visual artwork out there. I'm just, you know, I've never studied drawing. I've never been taught, you know, great technique and I have no natural talent for it. Um, and I do think in the case of visual arts, natural talent plays a role. Um, I also think that just practicing and developing skills is, is probably foundational, um, but it's not something I've, I've put a lot of time into. But that said, my sketches still mean something to me. So even though they might look very amateurish and very um, rough to the average person, um, sitting down and sketching in my notebooks for myself to kind of think about ideas or help me visualize things is still helpful. So I encourage you to do that. Um, even if you, no one's ever gonna see your sketches, that's fine. Um, the other thing about inspiration is sometimes, you know, often I get inspired by frustration. So like for this poncho pattern, for example, I was frustrated because I had a vague notion of what I wanted and didn't want out of a pattern. And I looked through hundreds of poncho patterns on Ravelry and couldn't find anything that was like even close enough to just say, oh, I'll do that, but I'll modify this aspect of it. I, I couldn't find anything. So that's how I came up with this, this pattern. Um, you know, I talked, uh, I talked a few episodes ago when I spoke about um, this multi multicolored set of hand spun yarns that I had developed. You know, my original inspiration for even spinning those was potentially to knit this particular pattern. And then I learned more about the finished item um, and decided I wasn't gonna knit that, I was gonna knit something else. So, and I can show you, I've actually been working on it, you know. So this is what I'm working on, <laughs> which is pretty outrageous for me. Um, the colors are much more electric in person. Um, this, this screen is not really picking them up. So, you know, this, this green, for example, almost glows. It's it's 
so bright and in your face. Um, but anyway, you know, this is mostly sequence knitting again. And you can see I've got different kinds of texture repeats going on. So there's one. Here's another one. Here's, this is bobbles. But I'm doing it in a way that's reversible. <laughs> um, and here we've got another, yet another sequence, two color sequence that's reversible. So, you know, I'm playing around with the idea of using multiple colors that I wouldn't normally put together um, in a reversible textured series of stitch patterns. And this is basically a big swatch um, that I'm working on, but I can tell you right now, I already have an idea for turning this into a shawl that will be using a readily available brand of yarn. Um, and I'm going to publish a pattern based on this. So it will not look exactly like this because you're not going to be knitting with um, exactly my colors of hand spun. It's probably going to be, look a little bit more cohesive than, than this, which has a bunch of kind of individual panels. Um, but knitting this and trying to solve some problems from the pattern that I decided not to do, um, trying to turn the mood or the feel of that pattern into something else um, that had different fabric characteristics has been a huge inspiration. And um, I already have ideas for yet another thing that I want to make um, just based on doing this exercise. So I encourage you to just start a notebook, um, write down all of the ideas that you have in the moment that you have them, and even if you have to set like a note and a reminder on your phone, like sketch out this idea in your notebook tonight. Um, I do that a lot because you never know when your brain's going to say, hey, I've got an idea, and you're like in the middle of something else. Um, but, you know, write down those ideas, draw your, your weird sketches um, for your own use, and keep playing with things on paper um, until you have sort of a concrete approach to how you want to start something and then knit a small version of it if you can. Um, I won't say swatch because even though that's what, you know, professional designers will base a sweater pattern off of a swatch like this, right? Um, because they're good enough at the math and understanding fabric characteristics um, that they can do that with confidence. And they know that, you know, all the math and all the the techniques and everything based off their swatch like this is going to work out. Um, I'm not there yet. I don't know if I'll ever do that approach. I like a swatch that's, you know, this big or larger. Um, I like a swatch for a large shawl that's this big. Um, and yes, it's a lot of knitting, but you know, if I were, were, were working with a commercial yarn on this, you know, this could go from swatch to sample finished piece uh, pretty easily. Um, so it's it's not, I guess what I'm trying to say is that, you know, doing bigger swatches or sample items is not a waste of time. Um, I think it's very informative. Even if you decide not to use that piece as a design, you'll, you'll end up with something that's finished and you can just give it away as a gift um, or donate it to a charity knit or, or something like that. There will be someone in the universe who will want that item. Um, and so I hope this um, insight into some of the things that have inspired me um, in my past uh, design work um, are helpful and spark some kind of uh, engagement or creativity for you too. Um, whether or not you're going to be designing from scratch or just modifying other designs to suit your needs better, um, you know, you can you can get inspiration from things like, you know, flowers and the sky at night or, you know, photographs from your last vacation. Um, but you can also get inspiration from um, designs or design challenges that aren't working for you and that you want to kind of re-engineer and make, make those things 
um, look better in terms of you know the fabric characteristics, the color combinations, um, the fit of the finished item, whatever it is uh, that's you know not working for you can be a great jumping off point into um, a whole new design or a whole new item. Um, I hope I hope this has been helpful. Um, I will link uh, in the show notes to a number of books that are great um, sources uh, of help to, to designers, whether you're just designing for yourself or whether you're trying to come up with published patterns. Um, a couple of these are sort of recipe books um, for things like sweaters and socks where you get a, kind of a template um, for those items and then you can um, play around with texture and color on top of that. Um, there are uh, also a couple of books that uh, talk about writing style for knitting patterns, conventions in terms of, you know, what information to include, uh, terminology to use, um, how to explain things succinctly and clearly so that others can work effectively off of your patterns. Um, and then there are things that are more open-ended that are like stick, stitch dictionaries um, that can just give you some, again, starting points for different types of uh, fabrics to create or different um, ways to think about color combinations and things like that. And I think it's important to have a mix of all of these resources. Um, again, especially if you are going to be designing for other people um, to knit your items, uh, you, you need some food, you know, you need some some starting points uh, to, to begin thinking about. Um, and you also want to publish patterns that are, you know, fun to knit and easy to follow. Um, so these things will help you do that. If you have uh, tips on resources, um, I know there are also some online classes for beginning designers. Um, there's a, a kind of um, workshop um, for designers run by Aroha Knits, uh, Frenchie, um, and I'll link to that one as well. Um, but if you have other uh, ideas or, or tips for beginning designers that you would like to include, um, please let us know in the comments, either below this video or on the accompanying uh, blog post, which will have the show notes. Um, I, again, consider myself a, a beginning designer. I only have a few published patterns out, and um, you know, so I'm still very much learning and very much self-taught. So any kind of resources or guidance uh, are very much appreciated. And I want to share those with others as well. Thanks again for joining me and tune in next week. Um, again, Rick and I are going to the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival, and that's May 4th and 5th. And uh, so the next video um, has already been edited and will post on the 6th as we're just coming back from the festival. Um, and that one will be the maple syrup uh, sugaring video, um, if you've been waiting for that one. It's a good one. Um, we talked with my neighbor um, about the maple sugaring process, a little bit behind the science of it. And uh, he and I also taste some maple syrup, which is really fun. So stay tuned for that one, and we'll be back with more. Um, we'll, we'll have a wrap-up video of the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival the following week. Um, and Rick and I will talk about our experiences. So if you're um, coming to the festival, please stop by the booth and say hi. And if you're not able to make it, um, that's okay. And we will have some new products on the website uh, after the festival's over. So you can check those out as well. Um, thanks again for joining me and have a great week and happy crafting.